I'm a futurist, what does that mean? It means that I've spent the majority of my life thinking about how technology is fundamentally changing human society and culture. Um, this presentation is gonna talk about a number of different things that are happening today. And, and what I see happening today that's gonna have an impact on the next few years, uh, 2030 is only 12 years away. <clears throat> and if you think about where you were 12 years ago, it, it, we're, we're already in a completely different world, right? So, uh, so let's get going. So this whole presentation, when I started thinking about um, what you do for a living, and, and I, I speak to a lot of engineering and gene scientist uh, crowds uh, you know, across the world, uh, and I think, you know, what do you do? Well, you're part of the invention process. Oftentimes, you're the people that invent. I like to go back and look at people like Al Jazari in the 12th century that invented, you know, early prototypes of automata, people like Leonardo da Vinci, uh, people like uh, Isambard Kingdom and Brunel, a uh, great engineer in the UK and, and everything that he did. And, and, and there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's so many more people than that that I can that I can summarize at this, at this point on the stage. But I think that invention is everything that started everything that I'm gonna talk in this presentation about. But really, at the beginning of the 19th century, everything changed. Electrification hit, uh, personal computing came uh, in like the 1960s. In 1968, a guy called Douglas Engelbart sat in Stanford and he showed the world a personal computer. It had a mouse, it had a, an early version of what would become video conferencing, uh, eight, um, the, the hyperlinking, it had a short, a short form keyboard on the side as well. And that was called the mother of all demos. And in just 50 years, we've all got infinite power in our pockets with with cell phones. Is there anyone in the room that doesn't have a, a smartphone? Yeah, typically it's the people that work in security. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, you know, we're, we're actually getting to the point in time where by 2020 we're, we're gonna have everyone in the world with, with a smartphone. Um, and then we got the internet and mobile in the 1990s. And in the early days of the internet, no one quite believed where we would be. And now everyone is on the internet in this room, I imagine. And uh, in the next uh, like five to 10 years, another four billion people across the world are gonna join us um, in, in that global ecosystem. So what's gonna change? Access to services, access to each other. And this is actually gonna drive business forward and exponential growth of what we do. And then in the 2010s, and really in the last three to four years, Huge leaps and bounds have been made in terms of artificial intelligence. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in detail in this presentation. So everything starts, I feel, you know, in the modern world with industrial revolutions. There's three dimensions to this. Communications, energy, and transportation. These are the three things that, that we, we work to develop new solutions, invent new, new ways of working. And today we're kind of in the fourth industrial revolution. We're in the, the digitized communications internet, we're in the digitized renewable energy internet, and we're in the digitized automated transportation and logistics internet. Everything is connected and everything can work together seamlessly, or so we hope, right? That's certainly the wish of where we're trying to get to in 2030 and beyond. And these are the eight technologies that I talk about the most. So I everything from like big data to AI, the internet of things, blockchain, nanotechnology, and quantum computing. I'm gonna cover in, in, in some detail, detail here. And I call these the exponential eight. I think if you were to take two or three of these and mash them together, you could come up with many machinations of new ways of doing things, or new infrastructures that we can build, or new ways that we can build foundational elements of business. I think that this is an incredibly exciting time. I think that more's gonna change in the next 20 years than, than changed in the last 200. Obviously, we've got the foundation of what we've created up to this point to, to leap from, but really, the amount of money that's being poured into exponential technologies, invention, research and development, and innovation is incredible today. So, when I try and see what's gonna happen in the future, and I am not always correct about what's gonna happen in 12, 20 years. In fact, we never get there. I'm always looking out and beyond. Um, I try and look at the signals of change. So when you walk down the street, when, you, when you're in an airport, when you're in a train station, when you're driving, uh, when you're, when you're um, like speaking to kids in a classroom, when you're spending family time, there's all these little indicators that change is coming, and I call these signals of change. And, and these signals of change actually indicate to me this new world that we're headed towards. And it 
does take a while for the future to come. I actually say that the future comes slowly, and then suddenly it comes quickly. There's, there's, a, there's a professor down in Stanford called Paul Sappho that says it takes about 30 years for technology to seep into culture. If you think about that with mobile phones or even virtual reality, you can actually see that um, being the case. Um, electric vehicles have been around for a long, long time, but now they're just starting to hit, hit some pace in the real world. So it's not necessarily about the invention. It's about that cultural appropriation of that technology and being able to apply that in, in new ways. And we don't often think about the best way to apply it until we've got it in front of us. Because I think that any technology that's worth its weight to have some, some impact on the future, you can take it and you can hack what it does. It's like taking an iPhone and realizing that you can use it to a as a hammer and you can hammer and nail it, right? You can, but why wouldn't you treat it that way? Okay. So the first one that I talk about, and this is the foundational element, and this has probably got the, the most growth going on right now, is around data. Um, it's the most valuable commodity in the world. It never runs out. By 2025, it's going to be 163 zettabytes. It's about 4.4 zettabytes today. What does 163 zettabytes look like? Well, it looks like a billion, it looks like a billion, billion high-definition movies. And when you get to the point of having so much data, what can you do with it? Well, you can't do something with every single piece of that data. We're probably going to find value in about 0.5 to 1% of the data we have available. And all the other systems in the world, once they're connected to the internet, are going to be passing data around up to the cloud, around us in mesh networks and beyond. So data has been the thing that a lot of companies have built their entire um, business infrastructures on. If you actually look at Alphabet and Apple, and you look at Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft, they're worth about $4.5 trillion. That makes them the fifth largest company, uh, country in the world in terms of GDP. And they've, uh, they've got just about 900,000 employees. That's not bad going, right? If you look to people that are going to change the world, it's the people with the, bit, with the deepest pockets uh, that are going to actually enter industries that they were never meant to be in when they actually started their companies, right? And over, over time, these, these companies have been built over 30, 20, 10 years. It's exciting times. But where we are in the world is I like to go back and think about data like this. Um, as individuals, we often drag data out of databases, put, put that into spreadsheets. Who, who, uh, who spends a lot of time in spreadsheets in the room? Yeah? Wouldn't you like to be liberated from that world? We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Um, but we take that data, and we work out what that means. That's information. And then we, then we put some narrative around that. That's knowledge. And when we apply it, and we talk, share it with other people, and then we take some learnings, that's wisdom. And that's what we're really good at as humans. I actually think that we are, we are in the beginnings of a wisdom-based economy. And that's actually being given momentum by all the exponential technologies that are coming. The second piece of technology I'm going to talk about, and I've touched on it already a little bit, is mobile. Now, we're in a world where my, my smartphone here that's actually doing some timing of this talk is, was $2,000 two weeks ago. You know, as things get more powerful, they're supposed to get cheaper as well, but that's not the case with mobile phones. Um, it, it pains me. It pains me to give that much money to someone. As soon as I get my iPhone, I feel so much more comfortable, and it's like my child because I've spent so much money on it, so I care for it more. But this is the new reality. I don't think that we're going to be looking at these little triangles uh, and, and these little um, rectangles that are in our pockets anymore. I think we're going to be walking around wearing glasses and headsets that are going to like, overlay information on the world. That real world information is going to be proving to be very useful in a work perspective and also in, in a context around um, personal travel and the such like. And I just want to share this short video by a, by a designer called Keichi Matsuda from the UK who tried to wonder what would, what would a world look like with augmented reality if it just went wild.
Olha a Now, th this is actually a video called Hyper Reality, and, and go and search it out on the internet. Uh, it's about 12 minutes long, and it's sort of uh, a sort of a utopian stroke dystopian view of what that future world would look like if we just let all the advertisers get at us, right? I don't think that this is exactly going to be the world that we're going to get at, but I do love to show this as being a, an idea of what that could look like. That was actually video down in Medellin, and then they used uh, visual effects over the top of that. But really, in a context for engineering and working in factories and on site, you could actually see how that, app, that, that technology can be applied to be very, very useful. Yeah? So you can see the flows uh, of energy around systems. You can see where things are broken, sensors um, in the machinery that we're using. And, and that could feed back data that goes into a visualization that suddenly you can stand above a factory or you can stand, stand above, above an electric power plant or, or whatever and work out what's wrong or how to fix something. So that could be really, really useful from the context of engineering. But I think the biggest disruptor that's happening right now, and I think that we completely underestimate what, what it's going to do to the world, is artificial intelligence. I studied artificial intelligence um, from 93 to 96. I was trying to program uh, neural networks to understand grammar. It didn't work very well. I speculated that grammar didn't exist. But in, in fact, it just, didn't, it just didn't work very well. Yeah, um, and we've gone through some periods of time where people have, have lost faith in artificial intelligence in the 70s, in the 80s, in the early 90s, and now we've got the computing power, we've got the money behind us, and we've got the big tech companies pouring billions of dollars into research that are fundamentally understanding that we can take huge amounts of data in real time, and we can process that through, through algorithms and machine learning to predict what we need at that point in time and to make decisions as good, if not better, as, than, than humans. I just want to show this short video of, of where we kind of think AI is. I don't think this is where we're at with AI. I think that we're, we're at a, a little bit more sedentary sort of pace. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> Don't destroy humans. Skynet defense system We're in. now activated. We're past the firewalls, local defense nets, Minutemen and subs. Skynet fully operational, processing at 60 teraflops per second. Sir, it should take less than a minute to find the virus and kill it. All access inquiries to your supervisor. Let's pray to God this works. Skynet defense system now activated. Power failure? No. I don't know what it is. Yeah, so the media would have us think that the robots that are being built, that was Atlas at the beginning, he can't actually speak like a drunk, sort of like hockey-loving kind of robot, right? Um, they'd have us think that we're, we're headed into a world where artificial intelligence is going to fundamentally unravel the fabric of our society, and you're all going to be out of jobs. In fact, I read an article um, about three months ago when I was preparing for this presentation, and, it's like, and, and the title was something like, How All Engineers Will Be Out of a Job by 2023. I don't... And it, they talked about artificial intelligence and generative algorithms, and there was some like insights in there. But like, 
That's not how we work. Humans are part of the, part of the, 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 the problem-solving exercise that we go through. But really, over the years, uh, AI has got incredibly powerful. Uh, Gary Kasparov got beaten by a chess-playing robot, and then IBM Watson uh, beat all of the best players at Jeopardy. Uh, last year, we had the world champion at Go, Lee C. Doll, ninth Dan, um, unbeatable, except he was beaten 4-1 by... Uh, by Google's AlphaGo, and then they transferred that technology and let that, let that AI learn on its own. It became AlphaZero. It learned Go from scratch in 40 days, just knowing the rules, and became completely unbeatable. It learned chess in four hours, became unbeatable, and helped it's now helping grandmasters understand new strategies going forward. So it's about human and the machine, and I love that idea versus the machine and nothing else because I don't think that's the future that I envisage. But it's powerful, and it's going to be able to do a lot of things that we can do today. You know, translating languages, driving a truck, working in retail, that's not too difficult anyway. Uh, writing a best-selling book, if you've read some of the books out there, that's not too difficult either. Um, but so some of the things like working as a surgeon, there's already artificial intelligence and robotics working in surgery context today, with the help of doctors. But imagine if you could walk in and, and you, you you never have to touch a human, uh, a completely um, safe and sanitary environment, and, and they can perform surgery on you um, with, with no mistakes, um, with, with a high level and, of, and probability of success of that particular procedure without any complications and such like. We're going to choose that world of, of accuracy. You know, how much are we going to have humans in the loop? Well, they're going to have to be there because, remember, we're the people with wisdom. Robotics and AI it's really difficult to encode what that is. The second big area of change that I see hitting us is around energy. And we're at a crisis point. I mean, there's a report that came out a couple of weeks ago literally saying about a rising sea levels, um, carbon dioxide levels in the Earth's atmosphere have, have reached the highest level. I think that we're coming towards you know, 2030 being that sort of hard end towards the use of oil burning um, like vehicles. This is incredibly controversial when I travel across Canada, especially in places like Alberta. Yeah? Um, there are actually professors that are much wiser than me, like studying this, that think that uh, oil is going to be about $10 a barrel by 2030. And I think that Alberta's got a lot of opportunity to, to change how it's looking at the world of energy production. And this is one of the ways. This is in China. This is a company called Green Panda. Uh, can, can you imagine why they're called Green Panda? Anyway, this is a 300 hectare solar farm. Now, China is leaps and bounds ahead of anyone else in the world in terms of generating solar electricity. It's because they've got a huge amount of land, and they've got a huge amount of people that they can mobilize to build this technology. In fact, right now in the world, the World Economic Forum actually thinks about 70,000 solar cells are being fitted every hour. That's every hour. That's not every day. That's not every week. It's every hour. And it's, it, the changes are coming thick and fast. Why would someone like China choose to do that? Well, it's one of the biggest polluters in the world. Why is someone like America um, not doing that? It's because they're stupid. Um, <laughs> maybe not. I, I'm not going to say all Americans are stupid. I'm going to say that there's one in particular that's very stupid. Anyway, so I can say that. I'm in Canada. It's all good. Uh, I apologize if I upset anyone, but... I'm not really that sorry either. Right. Um, so in Finland, I, I, one of the biggest questions I get, and one of the biggest questions I ask myself around solar is like, it's not sunny everywhere all the time. In Alberta, they get about, two, uh, about 320 days of sunshine a year. That's a good candidate to build a huge solar generation infrastructure. For that to be a provincial powerhouse in North America, I, th I think is an absolute real, real goal to have. These people in Finland have produced black silicon uh, nanotechnology-enabled solar cells that are efficient on a cloudy day as they would be on a sunny day, which is perfect for BC, right? This is in the R&D labs, but this is actually coming into production. Another thing that's coming into production right now as well are these clear solar cells. They're not as efficient as normal solar cells, but they're, they're like glass. So imagine if every building in Vancouver had glass that could actually generate electricity. 
what would BC Hydro do, right? It, they just wouldn't do anything for anyone that lived in any of those buildings. In fact, if you took this technology, and this is a couple of guys from University of Michigan and MIT as well, um, and they, they developed this technology, and, and they sort of say that if they covered One World Trade Center in New York City, with this technology, it would power 350,000 homes every day. So it's a game changer for me to see this coming. And, and people are starting to invest in this, especially out in the Arab states, like um, United Arab Emirates, uh, Dubai, and, and the such like. We're going to see that ch change happening. Uh, you look to Holland, and you look to progressive communities. There's microgrids that are trying to become sustainable, off-grid living. They can actually share their electricity through a mesh uh, within that community. That's super exciting to me right now. And what's also super exciting is some of the promises of battery technology. So Tesla went down to Australia to help uh, the government down there solve some of their, their energy uh, provision problems that they had. And in under 100 days, they delivered the largest power pack battery in the world. It's lithium ion. Um, it costs $66 million, and they've returned about $17 million in, uh, in generated electricity to the grid in six months. So if you think about that, within like a year and a half to two years, they're going to pay off the entire project. Now, that's some pretty good ROI, right? And we get into a really interesting point in battery technology. Right today, if we look at the capabilities, if we took all of the lithium-ion batteries in the world, put them together, it wouldn't run the world for longer than three minutes. By 2036, they actually think that you're going to be running it between 14 hours and a, and a, and a whole day. So battery technology is getting better. Um, the, the amount of density within a battery is improving. Uh, I, I bought myself a, a Chevy Bolt, and everyone was like, where are you going to charge it? I never have that headache because the battery is good enough to take me 400 kilometers in a single trip. And then the people that invented the lithium-ion battery are now invented the lithium glass battery that's got three times the density. It's pretty incredible where we're going. So lithium-ion isn't going to be the future. Something like lithium glass is going to be the future. So people always build on top of other solutions, and they're always going to innovate, yeah? standing on the shoulders of giants. And I've got some really great friends that work for a company called Carbon Engineering up in Squamish. And uh, has anyone heard of this company? Yeah? Yeah. Hey, that's really great. Um, so they're turning CO2 gathered from the air into liquid fuel, which could be applied to you know, um, logistics and transportation on a commercial scale, uh, airline transportation and such like. That's a game changer as well. They're not going to be able to suck all of the CO2 out of the air entirely and save the earth, but they're certainly going to be part of that solution in the future. There's some interesting researchers out in New York looking at evaporation engines. 71% of the world is water. Imagine if you could put engines over the top of like a large um, body of water and the evaporation could be actually used to drive engines. This is, a, this is actually just tabletop scale and it, it works using spores and plastic. Now, not all of these things turn into big, scalable solutions, but it's certainly interesting where people are going with this. And one of the biggest and most exciting ideas that I think exists around energy is around a global infrastructure and an energy interconnection between countries. Smart grids sharing uh, renewable energy, which is abundant between countries with agreements cross-border, and, and we literally remove the need to have other energy sources beyond like wind, solar, and wave. Now, is this going to be a reality? Well, five countries in Asia are actually building this right now. So China, Russia, um, South Korea, Japan, um, and one other country. I, I can't remember. Some of my, I think it's um, out in Taiwan. So this kind of global interconnectivity excites me. I think that this is going to be one of the big changes alongside AI, and data is going to be underneath that. And then if we look at a factory environment, we know that we're in a fourth um, industrial revolution, like I talked about, which is cyber physical systems. Everything's got sensors in it. Everything's feeding back data. We've got optimization. We've got the ability to have tens of billions of devices in the world with that sort of power of being able to feed back information, whether it's visual, audio, uh, whether it's temperature, environmental, whatever. And that's really useful for us to reduce waste, to improve efficiencies and the such like. And then in factories, we want more output, and there's going to be less employment. This is, this is an absolute reality, and, and this scares a lot of people, especially if you look out to Asia, where it's a factory-based economy more than anywhere else. Then you look at Amazon's warehousing. 
What's interesting about Amazon is in their warehouses and in their company, there's about 500,000 people, uh, but they're actually partnered up with about 100,000 robots. I don't think that Amazon's suddenly going to get rid of their human workforce um, just to replace everyone with robotics. I think they're all going to work together. And that's going to have a huge level of efficiency. And the error checking and, and the, the wisdom that we have as humans working together is going to make that company worth even more money. If we remember, both Apple and Amazon hit a trillion dollars in market cap this year. If you invested in Amazon at the beginning of the year, you'd be about 60% up on what you invested, right? It's kind of crazy. I mean, they bought Whole Foods for $13.7 billion. On the same day, their market cap went up to up $14 billion. So it's kind of a net neutral purchase. That's the world that we're living in. Siemens are doing some really interesting things. Look at this picture. Can you find the humans in there? There's about four, right? Uh, but this is where we're headed towards. And they, they automate their factories at, um, of a factor of about 75%. Uh, they've still got about 1,000 employees, but they're just, just really overlooking everything and making sure it runs, runs well, the wisdom economy. And then into vehicles. Um, my vehicle is the, the second on the left. Uh, so this is, uh, that's my car, Ziggy. It's a, Chev a Chevrolet Bolt. It's 100% electric. This was taken in Pacific Center two weeks ago. And you've got an Audi, a Chevy, a BMW, and you've got a Kia. And... Who would have thought that you would have that variety of electric vehicles and that many on the roads? How many people in, in this room own an electric vehicle? That's crazy. So if I would have asked that question at the beginning of the year, how many people owned that electric vehicle at the beginning of the year? Yeah, about a third of the people. You're the early adopters, so good for you, like you people, right? And, and what's really interesting is um, Tesla sold so many Tesla Model 3s that outsold Mercedes-Benz um, in the last quarter. And in BC alone, um, they sold, what, 268% more electric vehicles than the previous quarter. So we're starting to hit that pace, right? So you've got Chevy Bolts. Uh, you had uh, a, an experiment uh, happen down in California. That's a BMW uh, M3. Uh, it's retrofitted um, for about $14,000 with uh, used batteries. They, they charged them all up, and they drove 1,204 kilometers in two days. Uh, that broke the 1,000-kilometer range mark. That's going to be a complete game changer once that gets into production. The uh, automotive industry is going to put about $90 billion into electric vehicle technology. And you've got vehicles like Volkswagen's electric vehicle coming in. And they put $48 billion investment in battery technologies um, promised earlier this year. Why, why would Volkswagen do that? Well, they're not very good at being honest about their emissions, right? There's no emissions. There's no emissions in electric vehicles. None. 45% of all the cars that are sold in Norway today are electric. It's going to be 100% of all cars being sold um, by 2025. I think it's probably going to happen about 2022 because of the uh, subsidies they have in place. And now you've got Tesla's truck. You've got uh, up in Norway as well. You've got a fully electric uh, ferry. Uh, you, ironically, in China, you've got this massive uh, freighter there. And uh, that's full electric, and it delivers coal up the Yangtze River. <laughs> I can't, you can't make this up. It's gold. It's amazing. Um, but at the same time, in China, they're deploying about 9,500 buses every five weeks. Electric buses everywhere. I think we just saw TransLink uh, said that they were going to promise electric vehicles hitting the road. This is going to be our absolute future. Anyone that's skeptical about this, you need to like, send them over to me, and I'll show them this presentation. And if they're still skeptical, then I guess they're going to move to the States. But then engineers are taking it one step further. It's like, what if we combine solar technologies with car technologies? Could we actually put solar panels on top of a car? This is a, uh, this is a company called SunSwift that have actually built this technology. It's not very efficient yet. You literally have to cover every part of the car, and you have to make that car super, super light um, to be able to drive that. And that's one of the biggest troubles with electric vehicles right now. But it's coming, right? Probably 10 years. Okay, day one of self-driving. And then this is happening right ready? now. Go. Oh, this is weird. <laughs> this is the future. <laughs> yeah, she was like, is there no one driving that car? I knew it. I was waiting for it.
Thank you, Car. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Car. Yeah, so Alphabet, <clears throat> um, which is uh, Google's parent company, they've got Waymo in there as well. Th these are the people that are going to own the roads in North America. Uh, Self-driving technology is hitting the road in Arizona um, at scale and in California at scale. Everyone's in the game. Uh, the company with the most electric vehicles and um, autonomous vehicles in California on the road is Apple. You'll never know which, which is the Apple car because it won't have those big stupid things on top of it. Right? Because that's Apple, it's simplicity, it's beauty. And you wait until they hit the luxury car market. It'll probably be about $110,000 to buy an Apple all electric autonomous vehicle and they're gonna sell a lot, right? I, I would buy one, but I'm quite happy with my Chevy Bolt, right? <laughs> but by 2023, we're gonna see a change. The amount of vehicles bought and driven will hit a, hit a point of inflection. 2023, um, people will just start walking away from driving vehicles and literally have services in their pockets. They'll spend three to $400 a month and they'll have vehicles come and pick them up when they need them at any point in time. It makes a lot of sense to me. It's gonna hopefully reduce the amount of cars on the road once ownership goes down. And then you're gonna have a situation where the vehicles don't spend 90, 95% of their time parked. So imagine a world without all that parking needed. I think six billion square feet of parking in North America alone. What can you do with that? You can liberate it. But people like Volvo have looked at different kinds of uh, um, ways of thinking what the car of the future looks like. It doesn't have a steering wheel. It's basically either a nightclub or an office or a bedroom on wheels. <laughs> We're laughing at this now. Imagine a situation where you have to go from say Vancouver to Portland and you have to do it overnight and you don't necessarily want to fly and, and people are offering services where you can jump in your car, you can go to sleep um, in Vancouver and wake up in Portland automatically. All of the border systems know who you are through artificial intelligence and scanning and it's all good. That's an absolute future that could happen. It's like a speculative future as I speak here but it's a real future that's going to happen in at least 10 years time. And then Mercedes-Benz are thinking, what is a vehicle anyway? Well, why isn't a platform that we can fit transportation needs on top of as well, right? So on the left, it's just a small transportation carrier. On, in the middle, it's a really weird looking car. And on the right, it look, kind of looks like one of those scooters that you just uh, travel on, right? 2018, you had this company Embark drive from San Diego to, to Florida. Um, with almost no human interaction. So trucks are going to be the thing that drive themselves um, on their own, um, on highways before anything else. And now you've got um, the equivalent of Formula One, which is all electric vehicles that are driven by artificial intelligence. Robo race, based out of the UK. It's incredible technology. Go and take a look at that. And then you've got Larry Page from Google, um, who's the CEO of, of Alphabet. Um, he owns, th he owns th or he certainly invested heavily in three different flying car technologies. I, I like to call them planes. It is, but Black Fly is based out of Ontario, interestingly enough. Um, flyers down there in California, and, so, and, and I think they were testing Cora down in New Zealand. But um, flying taxis. You know, when's flying cars coming? They're coming. Then Hyperloop, which is actually an idea from the 70s, from some uh, defense uh, researchers. Uh, Elon Musk is saying, let's, let's push that forward, that's great. And now this is a $1 billion company. Has anyone been down to California or seen these, these, uh, these scooters? I couldn't believe it. About six months ago when I was in San Francisco, I was like, what the hell am I being run over? Um, you know, these companies are, being, are raising hundreds of millions of dollars to put electric scooters in cities. We live in a strange world. Cities are changing. We're, we're building buildings higher than ever before the Burj Khalifa. Uh, we're building um, small solutions that use other technologies, like these are concrete uh, large water pipes, and they're, they're 100 square foot um, homes for people to live in. Imagine in those dense cities, even places in Vancouver where we're already seeing some modular homes, having this kind of technology fit into the gaps. And then people are building platforms out at sea, it's called seasteading. So these are all huge engineering projects and huge opportunities for us to, to step into that future. I love this project, Salesforce, the new building down in San Francisco is the tallest building there. It's black water system. It keeps all of the water it ever uses inside forever, thus saving millions of liters of water having to come from the local uh, water grid. 
Uh, Barcelona put Internet of Things solutions in place, and now they save nearly $100 million a year through uh, parking, smart lighting, and smart waste solutions. They also created tens of thousands of jobs for the local economy, and their cities run better than ever before. That smart cities market is going to be worth about $3.48 trillion by 2026. Everyone's getting into the game in Vancouver, especially in Toronto as well. And there's about 1,000 pilot projects right now. And 500 of those are in China. And you can bet your bottom dollar that a lot of those new projects are going to be using renewable energy. This is the mashup of different technologies. There's connectivity in New York City. You've got Link New York City. That's been used over 50 million times. They just turned all the local phone booths and, 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 and phone areas into Wi-Fi hotspots. You've got sensors in Chicago that, that are cheap to deploy at a couple of thousand dollars a pop, and that can give you the information that you need about um, the traffic on the street, the people walking there, the environment. That feeds into an open data platform that can then optimize who the city is. Then you've got smart buildings like the Edge Building in, in Holland, uh, which is uh, Deloitte's HQ, uh, which doesn't have enough seats for all of its employees because it doesn't need to. It just needs to flex as, as it needs to on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing who's coming in, who's going, operating with black water systems, Internet of Things, uh, solar, and, and hyper-efficient building structures. And then we've got vertical farms that are coming because we're not going to be able to have the logistics from the farm to the city as easily because more people are going to move into the city context going forward. And then we've got the grocery store changing. Has anyone been down to uh, Seattle to see the Amazon Go store? Yeah? Pretty amazing, huh? You walk in, you scan your, you, you, you scan your phone, you go up, you take whatever you want, you put it in your bag, and then you walk out. And it uses uh, hundreds of cameras in the roof. It uses sensors, RFID, artificial intelligence. I think it actually reads uh, the mood uh, that you have when you pick a certain uh, thing off the shelf. And suddenly, you can mash that together with your online data, and they've got a complete profile of who you are. Data is power. Amazon becomes a $2 trillion company. I'm not making, I'm not making any uh, recommendations of stock investment over. Then you've got these delivery robots down in California. Um, these are quite controversial. Uh, people try to knock them over. They've got very, very loud sirens. Uh, they, they, they're also a bit weird because they've got to operate with humans. So this is a few years away, but it's coming. Security robots. This was also this particular one was deployed in San Francisco. Um, one morning, they actually found it in a fountain, defaced. Well, it was chasing homeless people off the street out, out the front of the building it was being security for. Now, that ethically is not cool, right? But what do we do? We need to learn to love robotics. Our kids need to learn to love robotics. In fact, this is a, this is a project um, where they this lovely turtle here. Uh, you put them with your kids, and they learn that if they hit it, it gets really angry and flashes. And if they stroke it, it purrs like a cat. But I don't think we've got a problem with kids getting ready for the new world. I want a robot. I want a robot. That's not a robot. <laughs> but kids are kind of used to this now. Hands up who's got an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home at home, or anything like that. And you've got kids, I guess, and they treat it like a big sister. And really what's happening is they're building trust in a machine that's got a human personality that's fundamentally grooming them to buy the products of Amazon, Google, and whoever in the future. It is kind of a dystopian future. I'm very serious about that. Be very careful about what technology you let into your homes. Convenience is disguised as your best friend. And your best friend's going to tell you eventually what you want to buy when you're 18 and the credit card that you'll need for it as well. I love that stuff. Nanotechnology, um, Richard Feynman, I want to build a billion tiny factories, models of each other, which are manufacturing simultaneously. I, I got to <coughs> visit my friends at the University of Waterloo. They've got the quantum nanotech building there that Mike Lazaridis put his uh, BlackBerry money behind. It's incredible. They're building the future there. Um, we've, we've got this. They built this. This was uh, um, the world's smallest Canadian flag. And then the year later, the University of Alberta built this one. You can fit 10,000 of these across the width of a human hair. Right? It's 10 nanometers wide. We can build machines at the atomic level now. 
And what does that mean for the future? Well, the revolutions that will come in medicine and healthcare uh, are going to be coming strong. Um, in, in data as well, IBM actually managed to fit 330 terabytes of information in a, in, in a palm-sized tape nanotechnology. Uh, and now doctors are actually doing research where they've got light activated tiny nano machines that can actually go in and actively drill and kill cancer cells. So imagine if you've got a, ca a cancer treatment center where people come in, they get injected with nano robotics, um, they get activated through light or whatever, and then within like a couple of months, all of the cancer has been killed and their bodies are, are getting back to normal. That's an absolute revolution. I'm very, very excited about what um, healthcare and medicine, biohacking and such like will do for this world. Then quantum technology, we know we've got D-Wave here. Um, that's a version of, of, of quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing is a distinctly new way of harnessing nature. It will be the first technology that allows useful tasks to be performed in collaboration between parallel universes. Don't ask me many questions about quantum computing. I'm not a quantum, quantum computing PhD. You're probably going to be much smarter than me at this. But very simply, quantum computers will break your password like that. It will break encryption like that. Uh, if you had a traditional uh, computing architecture do that, it would take thousands of years to do the same task. Using the ideas of superposition and predictive high-speed algorithms, uh, quantum computing is going to be the new power in the world uh, behind a lot of systems that we see. Now, I think the quantum computing is probably 20 to 30 years behind uh, getting something that's really, really usable. I think the people are exploring it. It's a very, very exciting world for me. And then there's the game changer for me. I was just talking to someone earlier about what Elon Musk's been doing with SpaceX. It's amazing, right? I always say this, um, here's a million dollars bet against Elon Musk. Would you? Who'd bet against Elon Musk today? He's bonkers. He's an inventor. He's an engineer, right? There's now going to be space tourism within a year. People like Richard Branson are getting behind that. You've got other space tourism, which is building this, putting it into balloons, you know, feats of engineering, new experiences for humans, new, new, new senses uh, of, of adventure. And then this happens. No one thought that you'd be able to land the rockets that you use to fire satellites into the atmosphere. No one. Like NASA didn't, well, they may have tried, but they did, certainly didn't um, like achieve that. SpaceX tried a lot, right? I remember watching the first rocket, uh, I think it was about a year and a half to two years ago. It was a Nat Geo uh, documentary, and the tension in the room, I was watching it, and they're running out to see what, and they're running back in. I cried my eyes out when I saw a rocket land like that for the first time. I imagine it must have been the feeling when you saw Neil Armstrong step on the moon for the first time. It's like the point in time where everything changes. In fact, um, Commander Chris Hadfield, who I had the pleasure to be on a stage with earlier this year, said that this is the new normal, right? And what does that new normal look like? It means that you'll be able to take off from one place and you'll be able to land in another place. And yes, Elon Musk is talking about going to Mars and to the moon, but I think that it's, it's really interesting idea to take off from London and deliver goods in Tokyo in about 45 minutes. The future of logistics, I'm gonna talk with a client about that next month. I'm not sure if they're gonna be able to handle this idea. But the big tech companies are going to be able to handle that idea. Amazon's already in the game with Blue Origin, uh, Tesla and Elon Musk and SpaceX. And bet your bottom dollar, there's, there's going to be more space entrepreneurs go, going forward. Then there's these smart people in Calgary. They managed to teleport one, one, <laughs> one photon seven kilometers across Calgary. I'm not saying that teleportation is going to happen like in 10 years or 20 years, maybe 120 years you might be able to teleport you know, medium-sized things that probably aren't living tissue. But isn't that interesting? It's a Star Trek future. Right? I try not to get too sci-fi, but when I say stuff like this, I get super excited. But what does the future of engineering and being an engineer mean? Well, um, I think the future of it being an engineer is that you have more agility and flexibility, dynamicism and practical ingenuity. You mash together all of your experiences and you're multidisciplinary. You've got greater prominence and depth across technologies. 
an extra responsibility and the opportunity to work holistically. So you'll be able to look at the, the whole solution. You'll be able to use all sorts of technologies we've spoken about today, and you'll be able to do a much better job. But it's about engineering the machine. I don't think it's going to be hundreds of millions of people are going to use, lose their jobs worldwide. I don't think engineers are in any, any form or way going to be jeopardized in terms of like their careers. Empathy, human creativity, problem solving are really hard to codify. If we go back to our uh, initial triangle there, for a computer to be able to do wisdom and knowledge really well is really difficult today. I think we're going to have engineers working with exponential technologies, working for clients on projects, and delivering something really, really special. And these are going to be tools that they use, and this is going to be the new model. Exponential technology is going to help us not look at spreadsheets ever again in our lives. Yay! But we're going to be able to look at the data that's going to be translated into a narrative. We're going to be able to use that as wisdom with feedback loops, and we're going to be working with exponential technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum computing, nanotechnology, and the such like. The world is going to be really, really exciting. I, I, I'm, re I'm excited about what can be. I think if you can dream it today, I think it's likely to be a reality within 20 to 25 years. And uh, that brings me to this. If you've never heard about this, it's important to understand that there's a law called Amara's Law. And it says that we speculate and overestimate that in the short term, technology has got huge potential. We overestimate what that is. But in the long term, we completely underestimate what it's going to do with the world. Just look at mobile telephony, right? I'd like to go back to Bucky. He's one of my favorite engineers, philosophers, speakers, thinkers, to think about who we are in this world. We're called to be architects of the future, not as victims. Thank you very much. Cheers.